Welcome all to what is going to be an extraordinary evening. We've all played those kind of parlour games, something versus something. In the Marr family on our way to primary school, it would be Prokofiev or Shostakovich, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky. Well, this is the simplistic version, Greece versus Rome. Now, I have to say, for those who may not have attended very carefully to the publicity ahead of time, I should emphasize this is ancient Rome versus classical Greece, which is in many ways a bit of a disappointment to me because I was looking forward to Mary Beard speaking out for Berlusconi and Boris here making the case for Syriza. Um, I, sin I sincerely hope there are many Greeks and Italians in the audience. Put your hands up if there's any Greeks or Italians in the audience. Just a few. <laughs> what I really want to know is whether you change your minds and go for the other guys halfway through this debate. Um, these things depend upon intellectual fireworks, and we have two kind of arsenals of intellectual fireworks here. We have Oxford and Cambridge. We, ha we have two great authors who produce many, many books and television programs. They have made the case for their studies for a very, very long time. Um, Boris, of course, is now running a city which is seething with kind of proletarian dissent, housing crisis, and, oh, and, 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 and it's... And it's <laughs> And it's leaders for the loss of the time stabbing each other in the back. So, uh, but that's why he's going for Greece, of course. <laughs> At any rate, um, it's going to be a very, very enjoyable um, evening. And we're going to, it's going to be tightly uh, structured in terms of time. Um, Boris is going to speak first. And you're going to hear some extracts um, from, from writings that he has chosen. And then Mary is going to speak. Same kind of thing for Greece and then they're going to go head to head. At that point, you will hear the, um, the verdict of the vote that you took as you came in. And the idea is to see which way you voted as you came in and whether our two speakers have been able to persuade you to change your minds and therefore what's happened by the end. And you'll get plenty of time to ask questions. I would ask only three things when you ask questions. Stand up, wait for the microphone, and be terse. All right. Um, without more ado, Boris Johnson, making the case for Rome. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. It is no... Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Well, it, is, it is no exaggeration to say that the answer to this entire debate can be found in the first scene, the first line, and indeed the first word of the greatest poem ever composed, the fountainhead of Western literature, which is, of course... The Iliad of Homer, and uh, what word does it begin with? Main in, that's right, main in Aedithea, Peleia, Joachileos, sing goddess of the wrath of Achilles, the son of Peter. Thank you. Well done, my father in the front row, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and why is, he, why is Achilles so cheesed off? Because somebody has taken away his prize, his geras, a girl by the name of Briseis of the lovely cheeks. And who has done this to him? A man who cannot run as fast as Achilles, a man who is not as good at fighting as Achilles, who's less clever, less charismatic, and yet who is able to expropriate his girlfriend or slave girl war booty, to be exact, uh, because he, that man, is set in obscure and supposedly God-given authority because he is a king. And in the wrath of Achilles, we find not just the bruised ego of a proud man, in that first line of Greek literature, we find the first sign of meritocratic indignation. The first act of insubordination that is to become the hallmark of Greek genius. And when you read the early Greek poets and philosophers, as I do almost uninterruptedly, you will realize <laughs> that you are often in the presence of rebels and satirists and debunkers. Achilles sticks it to his commander-in-chief, drunkard, dogface with the courage of a deer. Imagine if anybody said that to the Prime Minister. And on it goes. <laughs> on it goes throughout the, uh, throughout the archaic age, the Greek spirit of insubordination. And so on. I don't like the big strutting general, says Archilochus in words that speak down the ages to anybody who does not like being bossed around. And when you look at the pre-Socratic Philosophers, they're constantly uttering the most shocking profanities. The sun is a stone, said Anaxagoras. The Ethiopians have gods with Ethiopian features, said Xenophanes. And you know what? 
the horses have gods who look like horses. Nec ues coprio nec bleateroi, said Heraclitus. Dead is nastier than dung, dismissing in one three-word phrase all the ancient and holy rituals that went with the burial of the dead, a studied insult to ordinary Greek feeling, but intellectually honest. The early Greeks are challenging, they are original, and they're willing to express their feelings in a way that has never happened before. Like Sappho, going all green and trembly when she sees the object of her desires, laughing in the company of some irritatingly handsome man. He's equal with the gods, that man, who sits across from you, face to face, close enough to sip your voice's sweetness. And what excites my mind, your laughter glittering. So, when I see you for a moment, my voice goes. My tongue freezes. Fire, delicate fire in the flesh. Blind, stunned, the sound of thunder in my ears. Shivering with sweat, cold tremors over the skin. I turn the color of dead grass, and I'm an inch from dying. Thank you very much. That's Sappho. And as you'd uh, you expect, she's called, she's called the Tenth Muse by the, uh, by the ancients. The Greeks were the first to expose their vulnerable egos, and like all egotists, they were extraordinarily competitive not just in war, but in poetry and philosophy and sport and just about everything. One of the questions is, why did it all happen then? What was the reason for this flashpoint? And perhaps it was something to do with the topography of ancient Greece, the shadowy mountains and the echoey sea, as Achilles says. 25,000 miles of promontories and inlets that make Greece the country with the highest proportion of coastline to surface area in the world. So there were no big kingdoms with big rulers and loads of downtrodden peasants, but rather hundreds of little city-states arranged, as Plato said, like, frog, like frogs around the pond, puffing out their cheeks in mutual emulation. And perhaps it was the arrival of those Eastern influences, Hittite metallurgy, chariot warfare, what have you, that combined with the competitive environment of archaic Greece and produced the miracle. And when you go through that mind-blowing suite of galleries in the British Museum, you can see humanity working itself up to the Greek revelation. You go past all those Egyptian cat gods and dog gods, and Assyrian griffins with beards like ayatollahs. And thank heavens, by the way, that the Victorians ruthlessly plundered them all from, uh, from Babylonia, since otherwise they would now be <laughs> destroyed by Daesh quite seriously. And you come then to the Duveen galleries, and you see the marbles. Your Excellency, Mr. Greek Ambassador, I'm very sorry to say this, but uh, rescued quite rightly by Elgin uh, from, <laughs> from, the, from the Ottoman lime kiln. And what do you notice? You notice not only the extreme beauty of the sculpture, the first attempt at systematic anatomical realism, you see the spiritual change, because there aren't any strange hybrid animal gods, and there aren't any scenes of torture and beheading and massacre. And instead of the robotic processions of, of, of Sumerian and Babylonian and Akkadian armies of, and prisoners, there are human beings who are expressly differentiated from each other. One chap wearing sandals, another with a snood and boots, one guy got boots on, one looking this way, one looking that, one having trouble with a cow, I seem to remember. And you understand that you are looking at the ordinary people of Athens. That is who they are, and they are on the same scale in that 
Panathenaic frieze as the gods, because this is the moment in our story, in the human story, when the individual takes centre stage. And as Sophocles said in 441, the year that the Parthenon was being built in, in the Antigone, there are many fearsome, amazing things, Dino, how have you, have you translate, translate Dinos, one of the awesome things in the world, but none as awesome as man. It's not the gods, it's man who is the measure of all things. And what else do you see when you look at those sculptures? There's somebody missing. There's somebody missing from that frieze, colour. Colour is, well, there was colour, but colour is now missing. There is a, actually, there is a spot of colour here or there, actually. Uh, any, any advance on colour? Quite a good answer, but not brilliant. Uh, <laughs> any, 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 there's a character, there's something. Uh, who is missing? Who is the individual? Yes. Harry Mount in the front row, well done. There is, there is no king. We have reached the logical conclusion of that spirit of insubordination that we identified in the first line of the Iliad. We have removed the object of the wrath of Achilles, this irritating pasteboard ruler, and we have the world's first democracy. And whatever the flaws of that democracy, the slavery, the treatment of women, the oppression of allies, this was the first time in history that hard power, Kratos, was entrusted to the demos, to stonemasons and dock workers and fishmongers and the rest of the 10,000 who assembled on the Pnyx. And it is no coincidence that this birth of people power took place at the same time as the most glorious burst of intellectual originality. Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Plato, Aristophanes, Phidias, Pericles, Thucydides, Herodotus, then Aristotle on into the next century. The Greeks gave us philosophy and poetry and historiography. They gave us tragedy and comedy. They gave us biography. They gave us the Olympic Games, which, by the way, were later abolished by the Romans, and rational scientific inquiry into everything from the sex and mathematics and from the sex life of the cuttlefish to the steam engine. They gave us our modern system of government. And what else did they give us? Theatre, thank you, I've mentioned that, I think. Uh, they, they gave us Rome, didn't they? They gave us Rome. Rome was the creation of the ancient Greeks, just as modern America. Just as modern America is the creation of Britain, uh, although the, although, and though the, though, the, though the modern Americans don't always see it that way, uh, the Romans had no hesitation in acknowledging their debt. And yes, of course, the Romans beat the Greeks in this limited sense that they were more effective at wielding lethal violence. And in 146 BC, the legionaries smashed the sculptures of Corinth and they used priceless pictures to play checkers on. And then, of course, what happened? The Greeks turned the tables, didn't they? As Horace said, and is the point that is always made in these occasions, Graecia, Graecia capta ferum victorem capit et artes intulit. Agresti Latio, right? Captured Greece, captured her savage conqueror and brought the arts to rustic Italy. What was Roman sculpture? Straightforward homage, if not copied, of Greek sculpture. Roman architecture followed the canons of Greek architecture like Mary's little lamb. Not, your, not this Mary, obviously, but <laughs> like Mary. Roman food, Roman food was Greek Hellenistic food with the addition of that ubiquitous radioactive fish sauce that they glooped over everything in that vulgar Roman way, uh, like ketchup. And, and by the way, the work of Greek chefs, I owe this point to the learned Dr. Rushbrook, the work of Greek chefs was, so, was deemed so exquisite that they legally patented their dishes. Turbot seeds in goat's milk with aniseed or whatever, while Roman chefs were regarded as mere drudges and mechanics. Roman music, insofar as we know anything about it, was Greek music, except possibly for some popping tuba blasts at the games, and the great Roman writers and poets were avowedly following Greek models out of a deep, cringing sense of cultural deference. Virgil was meant to be the Latin Homer, Horace was following Alcius or Sappho, Tacitus was following Thucydides, and, and so on. And the first disadvantage they had to overcome, obviously, was what Lucretius called the Patriae Sermonis Aegestas, the relative poverty of the Latin language. The Greeks had far more words to play with than Latin. They had, they had long words like apocolicintosis, which is what happens when you turn to a 
pumpkin, <laughs> raffanidosis, which is something else involving a, a vegetable. Uh, and they had those, all those wonderful short words like ye and ti and met and dit and poo and ga. And, uh, you know, how could the Romans manage without ye? They couldn't. Well, they're not very easy anyway. You know, how, do you, how do you translate ye? How do you translate ye? Very difficult to translate ye. It gives it like that. It's like ye. But they did. And they did their best. And they produced astonishing results. And, uh, Mary, I'm not going to contest the genius of Rome. I'm not going to dispute that tonight with you. And I, I think that any of the, the, the authors that I have just mentioned, that culture, that civilization, repays a lifetime's study. But I reject some of the traditional points that are made in favor of the superiority of the Romans. I'm not sure that they were that much more inventive for all their hypercourse and their aqueducts and their brilliant way of linking their shields above themselves and all the rest of it. I think it is striking, actually, when you look at the thousand years of Roman history, how little technological progress they made, relying as they did on the, the brawn of slaves. We have no Roman gizmo that compares in its baffling complexity to the Antikythera machine that was recently uh, raised from the seabed, uh, whose function is in, in entirely unclear, at least to me. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure, and I know, I'm sure Mary will come to this, I'm not sure that they really treated, this is a very controversial point, they really treated their women or their slaves uh, that much better than the Greeks did. Visitors to ancient Athens often complained that you couldn't tell who was slave and who was free. And to get back to Neve's brilliant uh, recitation there, show me the female Roman author who can compare with Sappho. I don't think Roman quality of life was better. Greeks lived to prodigious ages. Thales, 92. Democritus, 90. Diogenes, 89. The Pope Apollonius, 85. Plato, 80. Sophocles wrote the Oedipus at Colonus when he was in his 80s. And pretty good it is, too. And in, in some critical ways, of course, I'm afraid that the Romans are still eclipsed by the Greeks. That's not just in my view, but in view, Mary, of the ultimate arbiter of these things, the market. <laughs> Take the two great authors of epic, Homer and Virgil. I love, I love Virgil. I venerate Virgil. Uh, he's probably the greatest verbal craftsman the world has ever produced. But look at the Penguin book. Look at whose books, whose books still sell by the millions. It's not Virgil, it's Homer. Whose story was recently turned into a Hollywood epic? And I'm afraid it's just impossible to imagine Brad Pitt playing Aeneas. <laughs> because with the best will in the world, Aeneas is not a romantic lead. Italian non sponti sequo, I remember he tells Dido, which is about the feeblest breakup line anybody ever used. You know, <laughs> It's not you, babe, I've just got this historic compulsion to go and find Rome, uh, he said. <laughs> Whose second point? Whose philosophy do we study? Who, which works of philosophy do we study today in all great universities? Not Roman philosophy, but Plato and Aristotle. Still the foundations of ethics and logic and politics and metaphysics. Whose drama do we still go to watch? All over London, every, in every, every, every city in, in Europe. Sophocles, Euripides, the Oresteia. When did you last go and see a tragedy by Seneca? <laughs> it doesn't. Finally and most crushingly to the Roman case. What about jokes? What about comedy? The Greeks invented the idea of the joke collection. They had one called the Philogelos, the laughter lover, which specialized in jokes about incompetent people. There was a very good one about the incompetent school teacher. He was asked the name of the mother of Priam, king of Troy. And he said, I suggest you call her Madam. <laughs> Maybe it, was, it all depended on how you told that joke. But anyway, <laughs> they were, they were, they were, there were still audiences in Britain who go, who pay good money to go and watch Aristophanes and his brilliant inventiveness, like his idea of women staging a sex strike in the Lysistrata to, to stop a war. In fact, Lysistrata is, is still so influential today that in modern times, uh, women have staged sex strikes in Colombia, in Kenya, in the Philippines, and even in Italy, in, in homage to life history. I don't know how successful they were, but they, they, they didn't. And, and you have to ask yourself, who stages Plautus and Terence today? Nobody. Why is Aristotle, to get to the, back to where we began, why is Aristotle, uh, sorry, Aristophanes, 
Aristophanes immortal in a way that the Roman comic playwrights simply were not. And uh, it was right there in our opening argument about the Greek willingness to debunk and to satirize. He was willing to make fun of senior politicians like Cleon and Pericles himself. And frankly, it is impossible to imagine a Roman playwright having the guts to take the mickey out of the emperor in the way that Aristophanes satirized Cleon or Pericles or whoever. And why was Aristophanes brave enough to mock the rulers of Athens? Because he lived in a democracy and a pluralist democracy at that. And as Pericles explains in that magnificent funeral oration on the dead of the first year of the Peloponnesian War, Athens is different and better because we enjoy a form of government that does not emulate the institutions of our neighbors. Indeed, we ourselves are more often the model for others than their imitators. Democracy is the name we give to it, since we manage our affairs in the interests of the many, not the few. But though everyone is equal before the law in the matter of private disputes, in terms of public distinction, preferment for office is determined on merit, not by rank, but by personal worth. Moreover, poverty is no bar to anyone who has it in them to benefit the city in some way, however lowly their status. A spirit of freedom conducts, governs our conduct, not only in public affairs, but also in the managing the small tensions of everyday life, where we show no animosity at our neighbor's choice of pleasures, nor cast aspersions that may hurt, even if they do not harm. Well, well I think when I listen to that speech, I still feel a sense of tingling amazement, because that is a man talking two and a half thousand years ago about ideals that still animate us, or should animate us, today. A spirit of freedom, the many, not the few, people rising on merit, everyone equal before the law, not getting hung up about your neighbor's choice of pleasures. Democracy. What did the Romans do to democracy, my friends? <laughs> what did they do? They abolished it in favor of a dictatorship and then the imperial system. And why were the Romans not much good at drama? Why weren't they much interested in drama, whether tragic or comic? Because fundamentally, the whole audience was forever being dragged off to another entertainment, the games, and watching people and animals being slaughtered in a depraved ritual that was endemic in the Roman world and virtually absent for, from Greece. How many people died in that, that building that is emblematic still of Roman culture and civilization, the, Col the Colosseum? How many people were killed in it? Probably 200,000. Ping. The Greeks liked the happy release of the theater. The Roman idea of good family entertainment was cutting the feet off some poor thief, coating his stumps with honey and letting the bears do the rest. I'm afraid that in many ways the Romans were bastards. <laughs> so whipped and brutalized as children that they like to inflict pain themselves. What's the most famous image uh, from all the frescoes of Pompeii? It's at, it's at one of the, the women whipping each other. Uh, what happens in Plautus and Terrace instead of jokes? People are hauled off to be flogged. It was a society not based on democracy, but on fear. Augustus wasn't some benign heir of the ideals of Pericles. He was a chill and subtle tyrant who massacred the population of Perugia, who gouged out the eye of an opponent with his own thumb, and who banished his own daughter and starved her to death. Far from tolerating the private lives of others, he banned adultery for all women except prostitutes, with the result that the matrons of Rome started registering themselves as prostitutes to get round the ban, and he was positively mild by comparison with his immediate Judeo-Claudian Judeo successors. A bunch of maniacs, sadists, and perverts, unlike anything ever seen, I'm absolutely serious, anything ever seen in, in Greece, whose model of pan-European pan monarchical rule it has taken us centuries finally to shake off, which a succession of despots such as Napoleon, Hitler, and others 
have tried to recreate. That is no model for us, my friends, is it? That is not the ideal to which we aspire in 21st century London, the greatest university city on earth, the most cultured city on earth, open to talent from around the world, as Athens was, free, pluralistic, tolerant, and respectful of the private behaviour of our neighbours, and not just electing our politicians, but constantly making fun of them <laughs> in an Aristophanic way. Those are not Roman values, those are Greek values. And I don't have to tell you, after the events of the last week in another great and free European city, those values of freedom are neither trivial nor are they uncontested around the world. So I say to you, let's fight for those values against those who would destroy them. Let's also protect and defend that great Greek inheritance to which we lay claim. Let's teach our children Greek, obviously, the Greek origin of their culture and civilization. Let's keep the Owl of Pallas in the squares of Bloomsbury, keep the Elgin Marbles in London. <laughs> if only, if only because we are now in London, the only city in Europe where we maintain the custom of those soldiers you can see on the Athenian friezes who are trained to be anabates and apobates, to be able, like Diomedes, I think, in Book 5 of the Iliad, to mount and dismount a moving chariot. But it is only here in London that you can defy the health and safety fanatics of Brussels and board, and thanks to the, thanks to the wonderful policies of this melody, board and alight from an open platform on one of our beautiful new Routemaster buses. Like, like, like the hop-on, like the hop-on, hop-off, hoplites of ancient Greece. <laughs> Vote for the Greeks tonight, my friends. Vote for the Greeks tonight, because no matter how often or how badly they fell short, it was those Periclean ideals that correspond most closely to our own. Vote for the Greeks, and remember, as you vote, that it was the Greeks who gave humanity the vote. And it was the Romans who gave humanity the vote by their immortal spirit of insubordination. And it was the Romans who took that vote away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Boris.